Parts Express presents Don Keel's keynote speech. Yes. You've listened to these a lot. Yes. Do you find um, a big difference when you listen to normal speakers now because they don't, your ear is no longer used Well, to that's a potential. I mean, the, the, the sound field is so uniform on this, it means it doesn't, depending on where you stand, it sounds the same. I mean, if we had some time today, we could hook up a real time and look at the sound. Then you can, you know, take a microphone and, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yes. Okay, that's a very good point. It's still sort of works, but it's not as uniform at all with the boundary. I mean, that's, I mean that's, uh, that's when you try to get in, in effect. You're, you're taking a freestanding CBT and chopping, chopping the bottom off and still leaving it freestanding. Yes? Don, are you talking about a perpendicular boundary with your array? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a boundary which intersects the center, the center of the array. You're not talking about a wall. You're talking about a floor or a ceiling. A floor or a ceiling. Absolutely. But I found that because the off-axis response is so uniform, the reflections as you do get off the wall aren't that bad. Typical others, you know, a typical speaker might have a lobe that aimed out the side. When it hits the wall, it comes back and is, provides a whole lot of interference for the direct sound. But this is so uniform, you know, theoretically. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting off track here. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, there is a, uh, some of you may be familiar with the constant directivity horn formula is relating horn size, coverage angle, and the frequency down to which the beam width is controlled. And they're all linearly related. And in, uh, in a, for a specific horn angle or angle on this, if you make it taller to the same angle, it extends down the, the low frequency beam width control. I mean, there's a frequency down to which the, the beam width blows up because it's getting comparable to the size of the array or more. And so you have to decide what coverage angle you want. And usually what governs it is, you, I, uh, typically I, I advocate broadband constant directivity, which means I'd like to maintain beam width down to at least 200 hertz. And so if you analyze that, as the array grows, the angle can get less, and it gets more directional. Uh, Very good. But that's, that's yeah. There's a reason it's that. So if this was a short array, like this high, you have to, might have 60, 80, 90 degrees, whereas if it's taller, it doesn't need to be that. I mean, you can make an array like this, like 12 feet high, that has a beam width of 16 degrees vertically. It would work very well in a, you know, a reverberant air, airline uh, space or something, or a Catholic church, you know, or again. You know, I got sidetracked here. Let me see. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, let me let me let me roll with this before I start demoing. This, this isn't a CBT speaker for sure. <laughs> yeah. I analyzed the sound fields of five different types or styles of line arrays including a straight line array. This kind of was repetitions of what I just showed you with the point sources, but I analyzed a, a straight line array without shading, and then a, one with shading, and a curved line array, and a J array. I and mean, that's often used in commercial sound reinforcement. You have a straight line array with a curved section down below. And technically, that curved section down below is supposed to cover the people in the front, right underneath the array, and the straight section is supposed to treat reach the people in the back. 
But it ends up that it doesn't work all that well because it's, it's very non-uniform. And as a CBT array, it works much better. And these are, this is a depiction of the, the five different arrays, six different arrays I analyzed. And uh, this, is an this is an example of a sound field pressure, magnitude, and phase. Pressure being on the left. And, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just quickly go through this. We're running out of time massively here. <clears throat> Can you hit the escape key over there? Thank you. Oh boy, now I need to pick up my Excel. Where is Excel here? Here. Okay. Oh, wait a second. It's a PDF file. Sorry, I gotta kill that. <laughs> <laughs> I got up at three o'clock this morning and finishing this procedure. I mean, my present my presentation. Yeah, procedure. <laughs> okay, I've got to go back to... Uh... Okay, here we go. It's a, I converted the PowerPoint to a straight, uh, to a PDF. Thank you. Now, this is the same kind of a thing, except this is in an Excel file. I mean, converted to a PDF. Now look what this is a straight regular straight line array. Now watch what I go when I go up in frequency. You can see the frequency on top, and the phase contours are on the right. And as I skip up here, look at all the lobes on the left that it generates. I mean it's very complicated. And furthermore, down you can see my cursor there. It's complicated in the near field of the array. I mean the change is dramatically. The pattern here versus coming out here. And here we get up to, say, 10, 12 kilohertz, and it gets very narrow. You can see what's happening? Now, if you hit the escape key again, Dustin, I'm going to go over here. Now, this is a curved line CBT array. And this happens to be a 60-degree CBT array, which provides about a 45-degree beam width. Now you can see, you see the shading over here? It's a curved arc, the yellow. It's shaded. I mean, it's, there's, there's louder here than it is on the ends. Now as you go up in frequency, it attains this, this beam width starting at about 500 and 600 hertz. Now look what happens as I go up in frequency. It's just perfectly uniform. It doesn't have any near field interference in the, near the array. Yes? Vertical. This way. You're looking at the sound field going in this direction. I mean, it, this, this radiates a, like a flashlight of a specific beam width. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, which, which, and it's independent, independent of frequency, which is what the magic is all about here. And this kind of a polar pattern, if you measure the polars of this thing and rotate around the center of curvature, you make a polar where this is rotating like around this way, you have a mic over here when you run polars. The uh, polar pattern is invariant with distance. You can measure a polar like six inches in front of the array and it'll be the same as it is at two feet away or 10 feet away or 30 feet away. But that's not the case with a true straight line array. It's different at every distance. But these are so well behaved. Okay, now can you hit the escape key? Thank you. Now I gotta switch back to the. Hey, yes. How do these work in the horizontal plane? Do you have any? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, no, I, I know exactly. <laughs> I, uh, the only, there's only one of my papers that was published in the AES journal. All the rest are preprints. And now, as you can imagine, a straight line array, is that, does that have any different radiation horizontally? Anybody? For the most part, right? Absolutely. But if you had small enough drivers, it would be the same going around. <clears throat> so I mean, that means that you're going to get HF narrowing. Click the link in the description for the next part of Don's presentation.